evening. We'll open in a word of prayer. Then I got two announcements I need to make. I forgot to make on Sunday. So I got three announcements. Oh, yes, I got prayer. Yes. Never mind the man behind the curtain. Um, Aaron had to take Joy to the hospital this evening uh, with some stomach problems, so we're not really sure what that is. Um, so there's probably, they said that if they weren't still there, they would be here, so they're not here, so they're there. So as we open in prayer, let's pray for them. Father, we thank you. Again, that we have the freedom in this country still to come and open your word and study it. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your word because it is inspired and errant and authoritative and we trust it. And so, Lord, as we continue to study on about manuscript evidence and how we got the English Bible, God, just give us great wisdom so that we can be confident in, in, in the use of the scriptures as we're using them to witness to others and to develop our doctrinal understanding. And tonight, Lord, we do want to lift before you, Pastor Aaron, and Joy, and just whatever's going on there, um, whatever the stomach problems are, Father, uh, I know that Joy suffers with endometriosis, and Lord, we just pray that it's not an attack of that, and we just pray that you would heal her right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man, you can be seated. Um, we're going to finish this evening, if you'll turn with me to... Um, manuscript evidence. And while you're turning there, I've got two announcements. We're going to be sending a care package to Stephen Jordan, Cody Meffin, and Michael Warren. They're in the Army and Marines. And so if you want to send a letter, um, we're sending them cookies and candy and sweets. And so if you want to send a letter of encouragement in with the box, see Kyle, because we're going to be shipping those really soon. And secondly, if you want your name on the new fellowship list, we're publishing the new one for uh, coming up for 2015. Um, you need to see Robbie. Can you stand up, Robbie? See Robbie. Uh, if you want your name in there or if there's corrections to it or additions, uh, you need to see her. Uh, some of you might have had some children since last year and may want their names included now. So cell numbers, cell numbers whatever. Okay, manuscript evidence. Let me just back up for a moment because we had to make that a two-parter on inerrancy. But again, as we're going to finish up the subject of inerrancy, and then next week we're going to look at um, Bible interpretation, 12 principles that you need to apply to properly you know, interpret the Scriptures, and we'll get into that. So we're just about done, and we'll finish it up tonight uh, with the information on how we receive the Bible that the Bible is inspired and errant. So I just want to back up for a moment um, and take a look at the definition once again because I think it's extremely important of what the inspiration of the Bible is. And this is a definition I, I would ask you to set to memory. When someone asks you what the definition of inspiration is, this is it. It's the act of God by which his revelation is communicated in written form. So it is the writing that is inspired, not necessarily the writer. Now, of course, they moved under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But what God's authority is upon is the written word. And that's why it says in 2 Timothy, all graphy or writing God breathed. So that's the definition of inspiration. And the definition of inerrancy, let's just turn over there. We're going to be looking at just the next page this evening as we finish up our study in inerrancy. Is this, the Bible is without error in its original autographs. That's an important statement. Because if there's a problem, it's a language problem, it's not a manuscript problem. Well, if you have the right manuscripts, it's not a manuscript problem. We'll get into that this evening. According to the original autographs, accurately reported in all matters that are written in the 66 books of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So that's what we're talking about tonight is inerrancy. What is inerrancy? And we looked at it, but we'll look at it again, starting with the Old Testament, the manuscript evidence. It's huge. Now, if any of you know the care that was taken by the scribes in copying the Old Testament, 
Uh, incredible care. And so when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can match what we had, which was about 900 years old, almost 1,000 years old, the original, the, the, the oldest Masoretic text we had of the Old Testament, and now we can compare it when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and it's, it's almost without variation. And so the Old Testament evidence is unreal. When you come to the New Te Testament evidence, as we saw last week, there are 5,500 pieces and portions of Greek manuscript, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 4,000 of various languages, and 86,000 manuscripts were the patristic fathers. That means those who were disciples like Polycarp of John, Clement, some of the guys that were just there at the first century that were disciples of the original apostles who wrote profusely. You know, we have 86,000 of those writings. In fact, um, Polycarp writes to the church at Philippi, and it reads almost like the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And so we can compare those texts together to make sure that our translation uh, is accurate. Now, when it comes to manuscript evidence, basically, you know, they fall into three categories. And this is where it's extremely important for us to understand why the translation you have and the version you have is important. Um, you say, well, a Bible's a Bible's a Bible. No, it's not. And it's important that you understand this. So I just, you know, we're going over this information because it's important for you to have it so that you can defend uh, you know, the scriptures that you have. And we're going to go through some of the English, how we got the English versions and, and why some of them are changed. And we're going to, in fact, look at some of those things. And I would recommend that each one of you have in your library, if you don't already have in your library, um, I have this eight translations of the New Testament. And literally, you can compare right there on the page. You can just look at the different eight translations and you can compare them word for word. And so it's important to be able to do that. And, and I like it because in this one I have, the first one's the King James and everything else is compared to it. And we're going to see why everything should be compared to it. So let's just dive right in. There, there are three classifications of manuscript evidence. And the first we're going to look at, which is the most accurate, is the Byzantine. And I'll tell you why. And then there's the Western. And then there's an Alexandrian. The Byzantine, if you remember when the Roman Empire was coming to an end, basically falling apart about 476 A.D., it was divided into the Western and Eastern Empire. Constantinople became the, the capital of the Eastern Empire, and then you go to Rome, became the capital of the Western Empire. And as the, they were being geographically divided, what happened is that although the Roman Empire, and this is an important history lesson, was falling apart, the church wasn't. And really at that time in the Western Empire, the Catholic Church was rising to a position of authority. In fact, they were the largest landowner, the most wealthy um, organization in that part of the empire. Um, they took on themselves the same title as the emperor, the pope did, Pontifus, Maximus. And so they really came into a position of power and they used the Latin Vulgate as their text, as their, and there's nothing wrong with the Latin Vulgate. I want you to know it's, it's an accurate, but the problem was a language problem. So the common people, as we're moving on into the century, spoke what? English. But the clergy spoke what? Latin. And so as the development of the Roman Catholic Church coming into power, they took the Bible out of the hands of the common man because he couldn't speak Latin anyway and only the clergy were able to tell you what the Bible said because they were trained in Latin. And so it became a problem and that's why we were thrust into the dark ages, probably one of the darkest times in human history as, as far as morals go and it was just a filthy time until the Reformation came when the reformers who were Roman Catholic priests said we've gone too far and we need to get back to the scriptures and we have the whole Reformation. So that is the Western text and it was generally from the Latin Vulgate, the common Latin language. And there's not really a problem with the manuscript, there's a problem with the language and, and how they used it. But the Byzantine, as the empire was being divided, the Eastern, which were Greek speaking, 
remained true to the Greek manutext, the, the original, which was known later as and, and cataloged as Texas Receptus. It was the received text. It was the text that was literally distributed through that area. Now, people say, well, what, what, is, what do you mean Byzantine? What does Byzantine mean? Well, it was, a, it was an area, it describes a geographical area, and you would be interested to know that within the Byzantine Empire, you have the city of Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, Antioch, where Paul spent with Barnabas teaching all those times, you know, we read in the New Testament, Corinth, Thessalonica, Galatia. Do you think those Greek-speaking people that had the original manuscripts might have a little better understanding of the original text? Yeah. And they were Greek speaking, not Latin speaking, so they stayed true to the original text. And so you have the Byzantine text, and by the way, you might want to put a footnote, that's where we get Texas Receptus from and the King James Bible. Then you have the Western text, which was the Latin Vulgate used by the Roman Catholic Church, and they added the Apocrypha in as though it was Scripture instead of making it a separate book of just history. And then you have the Alexandrian text, and this is probably the most corrupt of all the texts because it comes out of Alexandria, and the, the men who were doing the, the work there in, in taking the original Greek and um, in the original languages and putting it into common man's languages is, the, the, listen, they were, they were filled with heretics because they didn't believe in the Trinity or the deity of Christ. In fact, we'll, we're going to talk about how Westcott and Hort got a hold of this text, this Codex Alexandrius and Alexandrian and how they corrupted the text with what you have in most of your modern translations. We're going to look at that this evening. So when you look at basically the classifications of manuscript evidence, they really fall into three categories. The Byzantine text, the Western text, and the Alexandrian text. Now, how do we get the English Bible? I mean, how do, where did it come from? Because it's being translated from Hebrew to English and from Greek to English. How did that happen? What was the process? And we want to take a few moments and look at that because we know that the printing press was invented in what year? Your students? 1450. What was the first book printed on the printing press? Gutenberg Bible. In what language? German. German. And so now there's a cry during the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, we want the Bible in the common man's hand in his own language so that he can read it for himself. Now you remember as... This was developing within the Roman Catholic Church. The priests were saying, we've gone too far. And there were three points of contention that these guys like John Knox had, these guys like Tyndale had. The first point was sola scriptura. The authority is the word of God and not the traditions of men. The authority belongs to the scriptures and not to the church. So we need to get back to the scripture. Sola scriptura. Secondly, sola gratia, that salvation is of grace and not of works. And that's why in the Council of um, Trent, the Roman Catholic Church made the Apocrypha part of their Holy Bible. They declared it to be canon because the general sense when you read through the Apocrypha is a salvation based on works. And they were trying to give authority to their stance that you needed to, again, still go to the priest. You still need to confess your sins. You still need to do penances and all of these things that what Christ did on the cross wasn't enough. You had to add to through works. And so that was the second cry of the reformers in the 15th century, 14th and 15th centuries. No, we believe that salvation is of grace through grace, by grace, grace alone. And then the third was the universal priesthood. The Roman Catholic Church still wanted to have the priesthood where you had to go to a priest and confess your sins, and he took it to God. And the reformers said, no, we have a high priest who's entered into the heavens. And the veil has been rent, and we are all priests. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, each and every one of us. We have access to God. We don't have to go through another man to go to God. We have direct access, so the universal priesthood. And on those three points, the contention began to develop between the reformers and the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church to stay in a position of power over their people did not allow them to read the Bible in their own language. In fact, they would chain it to their pulpit so you couldn't remove it. And if you did remove it, you couldn't read it because it was in Latin. And the average person spoke English. 
And that's when they were selling indulgences and all of these things, and it just got really corrupt. And it's not that the Latin Vulgate was a bad translation. We have 8,000 manuscripts to prove, and I think Jerome did a great job in doing it. The problem was is that the Catholic Church controlled the Word of God, and that's why they left it in Latin. And then you have the Alexandrian, which is the weakest heretics doing the work, denying the deity of Christ and the Trinity. So now we come, as we're moving to the Reformation, and there is a need for the Bible to be printed in the common language. The printing press has been invented. The first book off the printing press was the Gutenberg Bible, but it was in German. And so we get to 1514, and the Complutensian polyglot, big word, huh? Complutensian just refers to the town in which it was developed, and a polyglot is this right here, what I just showed you, multiple translations. And so, in 1514, they started printing. This was the first Bible printed on the printing press in English. And the polyglot meant it had Hebrew, English, Greek, English, so that you could read them both side by side. And so that was printed in 1514. And Desiderius Erasmus, a name you're going to want to remember... In 1516, he published other editions, uh, and, and actually, the, as he's developing these other editions, he's bringing them out of Texas Receptus, and now he's printing in, in English. And then Robert Stephanus in 15, this is all during the Reformation, in 1546 through 1550, later bringing in the Texas Receptus, the Greek text from from Greek to English, that we also use the same text to get the King James Bible. And then the El Elzevir partners. So now we're, we're moving through the Reformation is what we're doing. And now we're, we're getting the original, going back to the Byzantine text, the original Greek text. And these men now are bringing them into English languages. In fact, Tyndale and some of these guys, as we're going to see in a few moments, paid a horrible cost to do this. You ought to be appreciating the Bible that you have in your hands. The horrible cost that was paid to get that. And in, in 1633, as they were going to the Byzantine text, it was known as the Byzantine text. It was the Elever partners that put the label on the Byzantine text and really named it Texas Receptus because it was the received text. It was the circulated text. It was the text that was circulated in the first century on through the first three, three centuries. And it was the text that everybody trusted. And so he titled it Texas Receptus. Brian Walton was the first one to make a collection of various readings. In other words, he took Texas Receptus, and then he would lay it alongside the Codus Alexandrians, the Alexandrius and the Codus Biza, and you could see the differences in variations. So he was trying to prove that, hey, listen, here's the Byzantine text. Let's lay it aside the text from Alexandria and some of these other texts, and you can see the changes that were happening. And then John Mill was the first one uh, that added patristic quotations. So not only did you read what John wrote, but you, wrote what you would also be able to read what his disciple Particarp wrote about what John wrote. Do you think these people were serious about getting the accuracy of God's Word down? And then J.L. Bingel in 1734 was the first to classify manuscripts into two authorities. He said there is the African, which is the Egyptian, or Alexandrian, and then there's the Asian manuscripts, which are the Byzantine. He was the first to say, listen, there are some texts that are coming out of Egypt that aren't good. And they, they have a difference between what's going on in the Byzantine text, the original Greek texts. And he was the first to classify that. J.J. Wettstein published an edition of Texas Receptus in 1751 through 1752, and he added a critical apparatus to the system to catalog the manuscripts. This was the first time this was done, so that when you read it in your English, you could go down and get the manuscript evidence for those words. He had a critical apparatus in his Bible so that you could check the original text with what your English version was saying. And then... Uh, Simeon and Geshbach, they classified manuscripts in three groups. We're moving forward. He says, no, you know, as you're looking at this, there really is three groups, not two. 
And it wasn't like he was in opposition to Ben Gale, Gale's work, but he was simply saying, when you really look at it carefully, there's the Alexandrian text, there's the Eastern and Western, and that's what we've settled into today. When you look at manuscript evidence, it comes from three schools of thought or three manuscript evidences. It'll either come from Alexandria or it'll come from the Byzantine or Eastern or it comes from the Western Latin Vulgate Roman Catholic version. And here's where it gets interesting. Now, thus far we have the Byzantine text accurate. We have the Latin Vulgate accurate. We have this corrupted text out of Alexandria creeping in. But we're okay so far until this guy named Tischendorf, Constantine Tischendorf found the Codex Sinaiticus in a, in a monastery um, by Mount Sinai. Now he's there visiting this monastery and these people are burning books to keep warm. And being a scholar, he's interested in why they're burning these books. And he grabbed one of the leaflets, because they were codex, which would have been leaflets. And he realizes they're the Bible. And so he says, hey, listen, let me give you money. You can burn something else. I, I want these. And that was the discovery of codex Sinaiticus. And so this, this hit the world. It rocked the scholarship world when this came out in the 1800s. Not to be outdone, the Roman Catholics said, well, we have Codus Vaticanus. And they published that as well. And now we have two manuscripts that vary, as we're going to see in a few moments, drastically from the Byzantine text and the received text, or Texas Receptus. And now we have a problem, and here's where you're going to get all your new translations. This was introduced. And what we found out later in history, and you won't find this in most of your seminaries today, is we found out where those two texts came from. There was actually 50 of them that were commissioned by Constantine when he came into power by Eusebius, to give him a Greek text that would lessen the deity of Christ and the Trinity and all the problems, and that's what we have when you get the Alexandrian text. Or Codus Sinaiticus and Codus Vaticanus. We know where they came from. They were corrupted texts on purpose. You've got to understand, when Constantine came into power, you remember he had the vision, and it says, conquer by the cross, He's going up against forces greater than him, and he has this untapped force, this Christian community that doesn't want to join in any of the battles. And so he declares that he has this vision, that he's been wonderfully converted to Christianity, and then, you know, and we're fighting for the truth, you know, we're, 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 we're crusaders, and all the Christians join with him. And as it settled down there in the Western world when he is conquering it, then he comes to this point where he says, okay, now we've got to appease things. That's why a lot of the heresy we have today has come into the church is during that period. And he commissioned 50 of these texts through Eusebius to be constructed we know where they come from. We know where now, you know, Codus Sinaiticus and Vaticanus come from. If you can say that fast three times, your, your tongue works better than mine. But so let's take a look at this. This is important. And so West Cotton Hort picked up on this text in 1881 and began this revival of new translations that you have. Now, Codus Vaticanus, reported to be in the Vatican Library since 1481, written on vellum, Three volumes, no ornamentation, ends in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. That's as far as it goes through the New Testament. It excludes the pastoral epistles and the book of Revelation, not contained in Codus Vaticanus. It contains, get this, 7,579 changes from Texas Receptus. And it also contains the apocrypha books in the Old Testament. And they're interwoven as though they were holy writ and not in a separate section. And then you have Codus Sinaiticus. I just said it right that time. Might not get it right the next time. 
over half of the leaflets are missing. There's something like 330 leaflets it takes to make the whole Bible, and there's only like 140 of them found in Codus Cyanaiticus. Leaflets missing. It contains the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermes. Now, Hermes, I've written and it read, and it's, it's, you know, it didn't make it into canonization, but it's a wonderful read when, when you're wanting to study eschatology. But it contained it as though it was Holy Scripture, and it contains 9,000 changes from Textus Receptus. And what we know now about these two texts, they were two of the 50 that Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, had Eusebius, he contracted Eusebius to write and we understand that he was trying to get away from some of the hardline doctrines that Christians were holding concerning the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And so these are found. And the manuscripts, get this, number three. The manuscript difference in the Gospels alone are over 3,000 times. Uh, there, there's 3,000 variations in the Gospel alone from Texas Receptus to these particular codexes. Tessendor changed his eighth edition all on the basis of Codex Cyanaiticus in terms of English translation. There are 36,000 variations. So if you have an NIV Bible, anything of the Westcott Hort, and we're going to get into what those are, of the Westcott Hort translations from Codex Vaticanus or Cyanaiticus, there are 36,000 variations from Texas Receptus. Do you think there's a problem now? Again, our definition of errancy is in the original autographs, they are inerrant and authoritative in all matters. But what are the original autographs? Is it the Alexandrian text? Is it the Eastern text? Latin Vulgate, or is it the Byzantine? The Byzantine never changed languages in that region. They continued to speak Greek. They had the manuscripts circulated. These were the cities that Paul ministered in and addressed. Wouldn't you think they would know more about the original Greek manuscripts than those speaking Latin or those coming out of Alexandria? Absolutely. And that's my point. This is why I love the King James, because the King James comes from the Byzantine text, which was considered, as it was circulating, the received text. It was the text that everybody received. They, there was no argument that this was Holy Scripture. And then it was cataloged in 1633. It was named Texas Receptus, or the received text, because of what was going on during the Reformation. So, you know, this stuff is important. And the evidence, um, number four, the condition of these manuscripts of Codus Vaticanus. Now notice, they're, they're in leaflet form. They're not in scroll, so they're not in papyri. They're not that old. And here's what the problem was. When they found them, they looked relatively in great condition compared to any other older scriptures. Codus Vaticanus and Codus Cyanicus looked in really good condition. So when they started looking at the date of them, they were saying there, there was a suspicion about the dating of it. Remember, when you start dating scriptures, it's what it's written on, how it's written, the condition that it's written. And the evidence of papyri manuscripts of the 20th century added, uh, they didn't have this available in the 1800s when Westcott and Hort were doing this, but the evidence now, as we've Again, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls and further evidence coming of papyri. It supports the reading of Texas Receptus far over and above what it supports the Alexandrian text or Codus Vaticanus or Codus Sinaiticus. So when you're going to get a translation, this, this is the point you just need to know. When you're going to get a translation and you want it from the best Greek manuscript so you know that your New Testament is accurate, Understand what was going on at this time when there was the dividing of the two empires, the Eastern and the Western, geographically when Rome was coming into power, the Roman Catholic Church taking the language and only speaking Latin, and all of the services were done in Latin. You could go literally to church and not understand anything that was going on in that time. Beautiful language, beautiful eulogies, and beautiful symbolism, but you, you weren't being fed. But when you went to the Byzantine Empire, they were Greek-speaking people that still held true to the Greek 
manuscripts, the Byzantine manuscripts, and they understood what the word was because it was still in their language. And then you find the Alexandrian text, which, which a bunch of heretics like, and the even Westcott and Horter of that flavor that don't believe in the Trinity or the deity of Christ. So if you're going to go to a manuscript for a word-for-word -word translation, which, in your opinion, would be the best manuscripts? Byzantine. Where do you think the King James comes from? Byzantine. Now let's take a look at some of these things. How, how we got it into English. Now remember, the printing press wasn't invented to 1450, correct? But they were making handwritten guys like John Wycliffe. In fact, you know, Gary and Gail visited one of their friends who works for Wycliffe Bible Translations today in Africa. This is probably one of the greatest uh, organizations that still gives you Bible translations. In fact, they're still making translations in almost every language on the planet today. They're still working on translations. But John Wycliffe, he lived between 1320 and 1384. He translated from the Jerome Latin Vulgate, which had 8,000 manuscripts into English. And it was a good translation. So he's taking it, but it's a, what we call a secondary translation. What would be a primary translation? Greek to English, primary. A secondary translation would be Greek to Latin to English. You see? Good translation. I think Jerome did a great job translating Greek into Latin. I have no problems with that. I have no problems with the Bible that the Catholics used up until they started adding the Apocrypha as, as, as canon. And because the problem was a language problem. The average person didn't speak Latin. And so you have Wycliffe coming along and saying, okay, I'm going to translate Latin because Latin was a, in the Western part was the language that they had translated the Bible into English so that people could understand it in the Western area. And then you have William Tyndale. Anybody ever heard that name? In fact, you buy a lot of these Bibles. What's it say on down here? Tyndale Publishing? Tyndale was burned at the stake for putting out of the original Greek text, the New Testament, in English. He was the first one to take it from, as a primary translation, not a secondary, not like Wycliffe did from Greek to Latin to English, but he took the original Greek from the Byzantine text, word-for-word -word translation into English, the New Testament. And in 1525, he was the first to print a Greek to English, New Testament from the Byzantine text. And it cost him his life. He was burned at the stake for that. Miles Cloverdale was the first to take a Greek from the Byzantine text to English, the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. And the Geneva Bible was the first to take it from the Greek Byzantine text to English, and it added chapter and verse divisions. So what you have today, you know, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, verse, he, they added that in the Geneva Bible, and then the King James Bible in 1611 was commissioned in 1604. My, I got some errors here. I forgot to have Patty correct. Would you correct those? 1604 and 1611. It's not 1607 and 1610. You know, there's a couple things that still fell through. But there was a committee of men, because here was the deal, when, 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 when King James was still a prince and he was on his way to his inauguration, there were some Puritans that met him. And a Puritan says, we just want to get back to the pure word of God. That's what, I, in fact, you tonight sitting here with me, we could be classified as Puritans and Protestants. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean? Well, we want the pure word of God. Don't give us the traditions of men. Give us from the best manuscripts in our language, as best as you possibly can, the pure word of God. We're Puritans. You see, we base our relationship with God on, on sound biblical doctrine. And we're Protestants. What is a Protestant? We protest that the Scripture should be in a language that we can't read. We believe in sola scriptura. We protest that the Roman Catholic Church would keep the Bible in a language that we couldn't understand. We protest that salvation 
is of works and not of grace. We protest that. We believe that it's sola gratia. We protest the organization of the Roman Catholic Church and their priesthood and keeping us from God because we believe in the universal priesthood. Those are the three points. And by the way, you're still Catholic. All of us are Catholic. Now you say, well, if you're Catholic, why aren't you wearing a robe and all of that kind of stuff? I'm not a Roman Catholic. I'm a Catholic. And Catholic just means universal. Because we believe in the universal church. Blood bought, blood washed, spirit filled. We don't believe in the Roman Catholic church because they've added their traditions of men. And they've taken the Bible out of the common man's hands. And it, even to this day, their decree is, is that the Pope's word supersedes Scripture. We protest that. In fact, there's a whole movement today, if you didn't know it, among the Roman Catholics to make Mary a co-redemptress, which means they'll have a cross with Jesus on one side and Mary on the other. So these are serious issues, are they not? Now, contained within the Catholic Church, there's enough truth to you to get saved. But there's enough error to lead you into wrong teaching. And that's why guys like John Knox were Protestants, the Reformers, the Covenators, made a covenant. We're just going to go to the Scriptures, and whatever the Scriptures say, that's what we're going to believe. And listen, if you don't think that's still a battle today, you see, I, I'm a word-for-word translation kind of guy, and we'll get into that in a few moments. I, that's why I use the old King James. We're going to see that there are problems even with the new King James. I'm an old King James kind of guy, not King James only, but I want... Because I am a student of the Word, I desire that you want, if you attend here at Gold Country Calvary Chapel, to be a student of the Word. So we want a word-for-word -word translation from the best Greek text. Amen? So there is no other translation that you can find other than the old King James that does that. If somebody would produce something better than the old King James, I, listen, I wouldn't be locked into this. But it is from Texas Receptus to receive text. It's not from Greek to Latin to English, and it's not from the Alexandrian text. It's from the Byzantine text. Those people continued to speak Greek as the empire was being divided, and they were the ones that had the information brought to them originally. You know, again, let's, let's just take a look by way of reminder. In the Byzantine Empire, you have the cities of Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, Antioch, Corinth, Thessalonica, Galatia, any of those ring bells to you? Paul, Paul taught profusely in these areas. He sent letters to these areas. These letters were circulated in these areas. This is the Byzantine text, the received text. And those people understood it because they spoke the language. It, the language wasn't a barrier for them. And so when we come to the English translation, what the best translations are are people who went back to the Hebrew is not a problem because of the care that the scribes gave to making sure that from the Tanakh it was a word for word into English as best as possible because we have such a, an accurate Old Testament record from, from, from the Jewish scribes but when we get into the New Testament now we have these three different schools of textual uh, criticism or the manuscript you know, evidence that we need to be careful where we get our New Testament. Amen? You follow me so far? Okay, here's what King James did when he became king. And uh, he formed a committee. And I don't really agree with committees, but I agree with this one. 54 men. He divided these 54 men into six panels. And what these 54 men had to do is they took the Byzantine text, Texas Receptus. They were given also all the patristic writings of the early church fathers. Now when I say early church fathers, I'm not talking about Catholic priests. I'm talking about early church fathers means those who sat under the holy apostles and their teaching. They were the, the ones that were really governing in the first century as the apostles were fading from the scene what was being transmitted to the church. Early church fathers, they took their writings like Polycarp and Clement so that they would have those to compare to what John or some of these other guys were writing down in the epistles. They were given that, divided into six panels. They spent hours every morning in prayer before they began their translation process. Hours. Asking the Lord to give them guidance and wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit would anoint their minds and their hearts so that they could have an accurate 
word for word from the original autographs of Greek and Hebrew translation into English for the common man because they understood the, the, they understood the gravity of the task that had been handed to them. They understood that if, if, if they were in error, they would cause the people to be in error. And so these 54 men, by the way, were scholars. They would speak Hebrew. They spoke Greek. They spoke Latin. They spoke Aramaic. These were true scholars. I don't know today that you can find 54 scholars. But these men were scholars. And they began their work in 604 A.D., 54 started, 47 completed the work. It took them seven years to do it, and it was finished in 1611. Now, before you leave here tonight, you can come up here because years ago, I got a little inheritance and I wanted to buy a 1611 King James Bible. I wanted one until I looked on eBay and found out what they go for. <laughs> then I knew I could live without one. You can't hardly read it anyway. I just wanted it. Just to say that I had in my possession a 1611 King James Bible. The, the cheapest one I could find was $300,000. So, eh, can't do that. But what I do have in my possession is an authenticated page. You can come up and read it and see how the English reads. It's sitting right here when you get down. An authenticating page of a 1612 King James Bible. And I dare you to read it. Because the S's are F's, and it's just, you, you wait till you come up here and try to read it, and, and, and how they spell different words. And you can understand what the word is, but it's pretty difficult. So that's why I'm talking about a language problem. But so they were commissioned, they finished in 1611, they spent hours daily in prayer, expressing total loyalty to God's word, and checking and rechecking with colleagues. Now, in these six panels, each guy had to agree on every word, and every six panels had to agree on every word. No greater scrutiny has ever been given to a word-for-word -word translation than the old King James Bible. And no translation had the best manuscripts like the King James did from the Byzantine text of the New Testament. You understand? And so, here's what we... We understand, and, and the slightest, the, 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 not even the slightest mistake would be made. The primary Greek text was the third edition of Stephanus's, published in 1550. It had dominated the Bible translations in English for 385 years, in spite of many attempts to show its inadequacies and archaic expressions. Now, I think that the biggest pushback from the old King James Bible, people say, well, you just don't understand the language. It's just too hard to read. Oh, really? Do you understand that it has the fewest syllabic writings? It reads at a sixth grade level. Well, I don't understand all those halves and halves not. Really? Half is has. Well, what are the these and the thous? That's what I like about it. What do you mean you like the these and the thous? Well, I don't like it just for its poetic character. I like it because it tells me who's being talked to. In our modern English, which is a poor language at best, and it's getting poorer by the day, would you agree? I can say to you tonight, you, or yo, <laughs> yo, that's probably the more accurate translation of the day. And what does that mean? That means you or you. So am I talking to you or am I talking to you? But in the King James, it's ye, that's all of you, or thee. So I know if Jesus is talking to a crowd or he's talking to one person. That's important to me. And the verb structure is important to me. When they're adding the E-T-H on a word, I know if it's a continuing act. There's a lot of things about the King James, old King James, that are important for me to understand in my understanding and when I'm studying the Bible that you don't get from these modern translations. You know, there's a survey being done that when churches use modern translations, the children in Sunday school don't memorize Scripture, especially using paraphrases, because there's not a rhythm, a, a rhythm to it. Now, I learned most of my Scriptures when I started memorizing. I remember I got saved, I needed, I needed to wash my brain, and so I started memorizing Scripture, and I did it from the old King James. 
And when I got up to 300 scriptures, I started memorizing chapters. Because I thought Bible memorization was important. I needed to wash my mind with the Word of God. But today we're finding that with these new translations, people aren't memorizing scripture. So when you look at the care, when we're talking about an English translation, no greater care was ever given to an English translation from the original and best manuscripts than the King James Bible. Well, let's take a look at some of the versions today. Westcott was a Greek scholar. Hort was a Greek scholar, but Hort was an unbeliever. Hort denied the deity of Christ and the Trinity. He was not a Christian. He was just a Greek scholar that was employed to take Codus Vaticanus and Codus Sinaiticus and translate them into what we know as the Westcott and Hort version. Now, they did that in the 1800s, and here's the Bibles that came from the Alexandrian text. So you can go home and check your library and see if you have any of them. The English Revised Version, the ERV, was based on Westcott and Hort's text, the Alexandrian text, not Texas Receptus. Now, this is going to shock some of you, the American Standard Version. Now, I like the American Standard Version because of its, the verbs it still uses and the aorist tenses it still uses, correctly translating them into English. But it comes from the Westcott and Hort School of Textual Criticism. And so I don't use it to study. Um, Williams translation, maybe you've never heard of this. It was uh, commissioned by Moody Bible Institute. And it was the first thought-for-thought translation instead of word-for-word. We call those today what? Paraphrases. You see the progression that's going on here as we're moving from the 1800s into our modern time, what's happening to the Bible? Do you know that I think there's three things that Satan fears? I think the first of those things is the Word of God. Because the Bible says that the foundations be removed, where will the righteous go? The Bible says that His Word is forever settled in the heavens. In fact, in Psalms 138, verse 2, the Bible says that God honors His Word above His name. And yet at his name one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The Word of God is important. When Satan tried to remove the Word of God during the Dark Ages through the Roman Catholic Church by chaining it to the pulpit and putting it in a language that no man could understand, the common man could understand, he thought he had won until the Reformers came along and said, no, 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 no. And the Reformation happened. And these men died horrible deaths to get us a word-for-word translation from the best manuscripts into the English that we could understand it. Do you think Satan rolled over and stopped? And then all of a sudden in the 1800s we find these two Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. Oh, it's the rave. These are the best. These are the oldest. This, and, and now everything is being based off of those. And what we have found out is Constantine had Eusebius make 50 of those copies because he wanted to change the Word of God. 36,000 variations from Texas Receptus. I'll look at a couple of those tonight with you before we're done. But you come to the Williams translation and it was a word, thought for thought, not word for word. And then the Revised Standard Version, the RSV. I bought one of those. They were selling them down at the Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference. I was shocked. I picked one up just so I can compare it because I didn't have that in my polyglot and this one. So I picked one up. I brought it home. I said, Kyle, this is a pretty good looking Bible. Uh, Why don't you, she was my guinea pig. Why don't you check it out? She didn't use it very long. Because, you know, it generated a great deal of controversy over the translation of the Hebrew words. And here's the one that, in fact, when you see Alma, it's not a K, it's an H. You can correct that in the Hebrew, Alma. It's another one of my things. It changed the word virgin, speaking of the birth of Christ in Isaiah 7, 14, to young woman. Yeah. Again, Alexander Trent's comes from the Alexandrian School of Thought. Westcott and Hort doing the translation and Hort was one who did not believe in the Trinity. He didn't believe in the deity of Christ. He didn't believe in the virgin birth. So they start changing words. 
Now, the reason why we know that that was the right Hebrew word should have been virgin, because when you come to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, as Matthew was quoting that, he uses a word, parthenosis, that can only be translated virgin in the Greek. So as we compare the text, we know that's what he was saying, yet they changed it. Philip's translation. I like to read Philip's translation. If you want a good paraphrase, I like the Philip's translation. But just notice that you don't study it for doctrinal purposes. I, I like some of the things that the Philip's translation has to say. It's a paraphrase. Uh, they received extensive promo promotion and uses for a number of years before the publication of the Living Bible. Now, I like the Living Bible too. If you want just an easy read Bible, the Living Bible is good. Don't try to memorize Scripture from it because it is a paraphrase. But there was a man, his last name I think was Taylor, that, that was a Texas Receptus guy. He was a King James guy, but when he would read to his children at night, they were going, what? And so he literally paraphrased the King James Bible, and I think sometimes he gets the sense and the meaning better than the King James as he's paraphrasing it. So, you know, if you just want an easy read, the Living Bible, it came into prominence. Good news for modern man. How many got saved during the 60s and 70s? Yeah, how many? Uh, you probably still have one of those sitting around somewhere in your house. You remember that good news for modern man? Yeah, every one of us had. I still have mine. You know, the green paperback version. Good news for modern man. Promoted as an evangelical tool, uh, evangelistic tool. Uh, started to be used more paraphrasing, communicating contemporary to a contemporary generation. Again, now we're moving away from word for word into paraphrasing. One of the things I love about Calvary Chapel, as we're moving through the 1800s and the Word of God is being altered and changed and rearranged and paraphrases are coming in and thought for thought instead of word for word translations, up pops a man named Chuck Smith who reached a generation and said, no, 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 let's get back to the Bible. And let's have the best translation and let's study it. And then you, then you come to um, the New American Translation. Again, it comes from the Westcott and Hort. New International Version, Westcott and Hort. Good News Bible, Westcott and Hort. And then you come to the New King James, and it has some problems too. Um, in fact, when they came out in 1982, Chuck Smith actually wrote a letter to the translators, and he said, listen, you've made a grave error, and it needs to be corrected. They wrote him back and said, we're not going to correct it. And the error that Chuck Smith mentioned was in Genesis account when it talks about the seed, the seed of the woman. And when you read through the rest of scriptures and study it, you understand the seed of the woman is who? Christ. And they translate it, descendants of men. There's other ones where Abraham goes up to offer Isaac on the mountain in the New King James. And there on the mount, you remember when they're walking up and Isaac says to his father, we have the wood, we have the knife, we have the fire. Uh, what about the sacrifice? And in a very prophetic way, because it's a picture of Christ, because Mount Moriah later became Golgotha where Christ was crucified. And Abraham says to Isaac, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. That's old King James. In New King James, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. It takes away the prophetic meaning of the text. That's another change. And there are others in the New King James. Now, if you want to follow along with me in the New King James, you can. But I'm going to use the Old King James. So when we get to those areas, I will correct those from the Old King James because there are problems. Hey, here's another one. You remember when Paul is writing it to the church at Thessalonica, remember he says, and, and those that, that uh, have died before, the, us who are alive and remain, will not prevent them. We said prevent, come on, that, that must be a bad translation. So we said proceed, that we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord won't proceed those who have died. No, obviously we wouldn't proceed. But as you study the text better and you understand the context, proceed, prevent was a better one because to what Paul was saying is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They have already experienced the resurrection. We don't prevent them from that. And so what we found out is that archaic language had a better understanding than our new modern English. So there are some problems even with the new King James um, that we need to take a look at. And again, the old King James, and this is a challenge I just want to give you, it reads at a sixth grade level. Yes, it has some archaic terms to it get a dictionary and get over it. 
because some of these things you need to know because they're actually describing something that our modern English doesn't describe like the old English does. And, you know, we need to be wiser. We don't need, listen, we need to be students. And I love the poetic language, to be very honest with you. Um, What else can we say about it? I think that's about it. Um, What I want to do now is take a look at a couple things that I think that are extremely important when you talk about Alexandrian texts, because the two dominant ones today now, because how many read Latin? Anybody read Latin? Anybody have a Latin Vulgate with them? Anybody? I had a lady in the last church I passed her that, that read Latin, had a Latin Vulgate. But she also read French and German. Sometimes I'd pick up after church, you know, people leave their stuff and she would leave Bible laying there. And it, it, one day it was a German Bible I had, because she was a really dingy gal and one of our good friends. And she'd come, I mean, she would just come in the evening, you ask Colin, just rupt our whole evening and leave like a whirlwind. She just was like a... The, she was dark haired, but she was, could have been. I better shut up. Take that off the tape. But, uh, but she would leave her Bible laying around the churches, at the church. And it, one time it would be a German Bible, next time it would be a French Bible, next time it would be a Latin Vulgate. And, uh, and she would just tell me, I'm just checking you out, making sure you're getting it right. And so, but basically what you're going to find today is that you're going to have an English Bible because we speak English. And it's going to come from two different manuscript evidences. It's either going to come from the Alexandrian text or the Byzantine text. And it makes a difference. Like I said, 36,000 variations. The Alexandrian text from Textus Receptus. 3,000 in the Gospels alone. It's amazing. But if you'll turn with me to Revelation... That's why it's important, I think, for you to have one of these eight translation Bibles. Tyndale, I think this one here is pretty old. I've had it for a long time. My mother-in-law bought this for me when I first started in the ministry 30 years ago. Um, Made me come up on the stage and had the pastor present it to me. Embarrassed me. I'll never forget that. Every time I pick this Bible up, I remember how she laughed by embarrassing me. And so... uh, But it has the King James, the Living Bible, Phillips Translation, Revised Standard Version, Today's English Version, New International Version, Jerusalem Bible, and New English Bible. All eight of those side by side. And let let me show you where some of the problems come in. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 5. We did a little bit of this last week, but while we have a few moments, I just want to look at this. And then we're going to look at 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. And in the King James Bible, which comes from the Byzantine text, Texas Receptus, when you get to verse 9, it reads this. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and thou hast redeemed us unto God by thy blood out of every kindred and every tongue and every nation. Now, who would you say, is singing the new song and talking about being redeemed? The church. Us. Who can sing the song of the redeemed but the church? Can anyone else say, by thy blood you've redeemed us from every tongue, tribe, and people? No. Well, let's take a look at the New International Version. That is the most widely publicized West Cotton Hort Alexandrian text Bible today. In fact, many of you, when you first showed up to Gold Country Calvary Chapel, were packing one of those. What did I tell you you need to do with that? Start your fires. (laughs) But don't use it to study. If you want an easy translation to read, get the Living Bible or get the Phillips translation. Those are great paraphrases. But don't get this new... I don't want you to be NIV positive. Because this is the nearly inspired version. Here's what it reads. Listen carefully to the subtle difference. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God. For every tribe, language, tongue, and people and nation. And so... People who read this translation say, well, he's talking. These are angels singing to God. This new song speaking of those who are going to be redeemed. 
But the church is not in heaven at this time. Now, in the defense of the Westcott and Hort Alexandrian text translation, they will say to you that the majority of manuscripts, because there was 240 when Westcott and Hort published the NIV. Now there's something like 303. When we talk about manuscripts, we're talking about not those that have been discovered, but those that have been cataloged. There could be many more manuscripts sitting in museum basements that have not been cataloged yet. So when we're talking about manuscript evidence, we're talking about those that have been cataloged. They've been read and researched and cataloged and published for people to see. At Westcott and Hort writing, there was 240. There's something like 303. I've read as many as 350 now because, you know, we're finding more of these things as we go. And they will tell you, well... You know, only 23 out of the 240 say us. Well, they're right. So they give you the impression, well, the majority of the manuscripts put it the other way. But that's, that's, that's deceptive. Because out of the 240, only 24 of our manuscripts contain Revelation 5.9. 23 of them say us. So what is the greater manuscript evidence? Us. But yet you go to this new international version and it will change and it will skew your eschatology because in chapter 5 the church is in heaven. Only they can sing that song. And again, when you understand biblical, as we're going to look at it next week, interpretation, there are 800 references from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And when it talks about the 24 elders seated on 24 thrones, clothed in white raiment and crowns of gold, that can only be the church. Well, we'll say, well, what, who, what's, why is 24? Well, when you go back to the Old Testament, what was the priesthood divided in? How many sections? 24. What does the Bible say you are in the New Testament? You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. Who gets to wear white and crowns of gold? Only the church. Church is in heaven in chapter 4. It's in heaven in chapter 5. When does the tribulation start? The wrath of God poured out? Chapter 6. Why are we pre-trib? Because the manuscript evidence of a word-for-word translation tells us we're out of here before God pours out His wrath. The first three centuries, there was only one interpretation. It was a pre-trib rapture followed by a seven-year tribulation and then the millennial reign of Christ. That's all they taught because they were at the accurate understanding of the Word of God. People say, well, you can't promote that. Well, yeah, I can. Why? Because the Bible teaches it. Now, let's take a look at 1 John. We've got a few moments. I just want to show you the differences. If there's any questions, then we can have that. And Because we're, we're, we're leaving now the inspiration and errancy. And I've given you, I think, enough of a Reader's Digest version for you to understand why translations, the one you have, is important and where they come from and how we got them. Do, do you think we've done a good enough job covering that? Yeah, I don't want to spend any more time. I want to get into Bible doctrine. That's what I love. But let's turn to 1 John. Chapter 5, and I'll show you another dishonesty here. This is, the point I'm trying to make is there's, when you come to the Alexander, there's dishonesty going on. Chapter 5, let's take a look at verse 7. I was just showing this to Jeff because he was asking me about it. Now when you come to verses, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, it reads, let me read it to you. This is fine print. For there are three that bear record in heaven. See, now we're going to teach the Trinity, right? The Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. Interesting. What are we talking about in Hebrews? Who was Jesus before He was Jesus? He was the Word. And the Word became flesh. Eternal with the Father. He's God the Word. God the Father. God the Word. God the Holy Spirit. All three were involved in creation. Three bear witness in in heaven. And these three are one. Now we've got the triuneness of God being taught. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are one. And if we receive the witness of men, then the witness of God is greater. And it goes on. But now you read down New International Version, for there are three who that testify the Spirit, the water, the blood. What? What happened to the Word? Watch this. Read it again. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, the blood. And these three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony. You have left out the teaching of the triune God and the Trinity. 
Then you look at your footnote, and it will say down here, the late manuscripts of the Vulgate add, the late manuscripts of the Vulgate add, heaven, the Father, and the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These are three, and there are three that do testify. They put it in a footnote, and they're referencing the Vulgate. Let's go to the Byzantine text, Texas Receptus. What was in Texas Receptus? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. You see how dishonest this is? And there are 36,000 of those in the New International Version that changed the meaning. Because Hort was an atheist. He didn't believe in the deity of Christ and he didn't believe in the triunity of God. So he changed things. So if we're going to study doctrine and we're going to launch off into that, we're going to teach you how to study next week and then we're going to launch into doctrine the week after that, wouldn't it be important, and I've added this study. I, originally, I wasn't going to talk about history and this in the Bible because I thought some of you would gag on boredom. But I thought it important enough for you to understand that when you open this Bible, you can trust it because it's inspired, it's inerrant, and it's authoritative. But it, it's only so in the original autographs, and which are the original autographs that we want to stand on? The best the Byzantine text, which would be Textus Receptus, the received text, the circulated text, the text that was not argued to be the right text until way up into the 1500s. You understand? So that's why if you're going to come and study Bible doctrine with us, I would recommend that you buy yourself an old King James Bible if you don't already have one. And I think I've given you enough reasons for it. Are there any questions about it? I think, people have asked me over the years, why do you think all of the new translations, why do you think, guys, I think people like to sell Bibles. But the King James still outsells every other translation. I think it's two to one. All others put together versus the King James two to one. Because it is a accurate from the old Hebrew and the Byzantine Greek text, a word for word translation that 54 scholars divided into panel, six panels that had to agree on every word. And they took in also consideration of the patristic father's teaching of the, in the early church. And I don't think any care has been given to it better. Now, again, as we close out tonight, let's go back again. I just want to read you again the, the definition of inerrancy and the definition of inspiration. Let's do inspiration first. I think this is extremely important because how many times have you heard me stand up in the pulpit and say, I believe that the Bible is inspired of God, inerrant and authoritative. How many times have you heard me say that? Like almost every Sunday. Because I believe this to be the Word of God. I don't think it contains the Word of God. Some people will tell you it contains the Word of God. No, it does not contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Some churches will tell you, well, we preach the Word of God. We teach out of the Bible. We're not told to teach out of the Bible. We're told to teach the Bible. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. You better be going from Genesis to Revelation, understanding all of it. You can't even understand the New Testament until you understand the Old Testament. Like I said, 800 references in the book of Revelation to the Old Testament. How much more New Testament can you get than the book of Revelation? And you won't understand it if you don't understand the Old Testament. That's why it's important for you to be here on Wednesday nights when we're studying the Old Testament. I know we're putting a lot on you. You're here Monday night for a depth study, and we're asking you to be here Wednesday night where we're going through the Old Testament. We're starting the book of Exodus. You know, we've finished Genesis, and we're working our way through. You need to be here, gang. Now listen, this is going to matter, I think, in a very short period of time, because although I am pre trib or pre-wrath better it would be my eschatology, I believe we're out of here before God pours out of His wrath, but I am not pre-trouble. Understand? I think things are brewing right now where you're going to have to know what you believe and stand on it. And it could cost you your life for it. And I'm not trying to freak any of you out. I believe that with all my heart. I believe some heavy persecution is headed our way. And if you don't believe this Bible is everything it said it was, you won't stand on it and you won't defend it. I will stand on it and defend it to my last breath. And don't you tell me it says something it doesn't say. And don't tell me men wrote it. Because the authority is on the writing. And don't tell me the Alexandrian text was the oldest and best. It wasn't. Don't you lead me astray like that. 
I'm not that stupid. I may look that way. I may look like I can't rub two brain cells together at the same time. But I'm, I'm some dumb, but I'm not plumb dumb. Amen? Definition of inspiration. Don't ever forget this. Memorize it. The act of God by which His revelation is communicated in written form. Very important. Definition of inerrancy. The Bible is without error in its original autographs, accurately reporting all matters which are written in the 66 books of the Old Testament and New Testament. The original autographs, we have to go back to the original text, the original manuscripts. And which out of the three, Byzantine, Eastern, or Alexandrian, which is the best manuscript? Let's say it really loud, gang. Byzantine. Where do you get your King James Bible from? Byzantine. What was the Byzantine text considered to be? Texas, Texas Receptus. Okay, you're good students. Now we're going to study next week on how to apply 12 principles to Bible interpretation so that you don't go astray when you're, when you're reading and studying for yourself, okay? Let's stand and we'll close in a word of prayer. And again, I want you guys to know when you leave here, we're, I'm not bashing the Catholics. Uh, the Protestants have their own set of problems. You understand? Uh, I, I'm not bashing anybody. I, I just have to point out where these things happened and why they happened so you understand. You understand? We'll say, so don't go out of here saying, you know, Pastor Mike, he's bashing Catholics. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not bashing Catholics. And people say, well, you know, Pastor Mike doesn't believe the Apocrypha should be in the Bible. I don't believe it is canonization. I don't think it should be part of the canon. But I'm not opposed to your reading it. I've read it. But it's not Scripture. It's good history. Some of it. Some of it gets kind of weird. But hey, read it. I've read the Koran. Boy, it doesn't read like Scripture at all. It's... <laughs> There's no anointing on it. There's no understanding in it. And it's, 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 I'll be careful. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't own it. I have a Bible up in my office that has the Apocrypha in it. And every once in a while I like to read those things. And there's other writings of Peter. I like the Shepherd of Hermes. It really is a great commentary by a man who was no doubt loved the Lord and understood doctrine that wrote profusely on end times, eschatology. But it didn't make it into this. And we've gone over what it took it to, with you guys, what it took to make it into this. And when our church fathers at the Council of Nicaea in, in what was it, 387, A.D. said, hey, we, we believe that we have the entire Bible. We don't need to add anything to it. Everything that we need to know is here. It, this, is the, this is the fulfillment of it. Then that's good enough for me. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you for this study tonight and for the people who so faithfully come out. It's important that we know why we trust the Bible. And as we move in in the next couple of weeks at the Bible Doctrine, help us just to pay attention to those things, Father. They will be important in the near future. As you will call us to stand. As the saints of old stood and earnestly defend the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Lord, we see just through translations an attack again on your word to change its meaning. Lord, help us not to be deceived. It's interesting that Jesus, when asked what would be the signs of the end of the world and the coming of Christ, the very first thing he mentioned was deception. We don't want to be deceived. We want to stand firmly upon your word. And so, Lord, help us to be students of it, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's kids would say, Amen, amen. God bless you.